Well, good morning, everybody, once again. It's great to see everybody. I don't really relax. It's okay. Have a, have a terrific uh, uh, show for you today. It's, uh, it's uh, Stephen Zolf, who is one of my favorite partners here. He's, he's got a face for radio, I can tell you that. Good morning, Don. <laughs> and Claudio Popa. Uh, Claudio, you know from, from some previous webinars, uh, he's a privacy expert, data security expert, and, uh, uh, well, the background here is that Stephen and I were asking Claudio a few questions a couple of weeks ago, three, four weeks ago, about malware, and malicious content, and all that kind of stuff. And uh, uh, Claudio had a, a kind of an interesting uh, take on it, and our focus was really on, you know, what, what should be the, the job of ISPs? Right. Do they have a duty? Who has a duty? And, and, uh, and of course, Claudio, as usual, kind of shakes things up a bit. So Claudio uh, brought uh, 5,000 slides with him today. So <laughs> Claudio, be careful what you ask for. <laughs> that's, that, that's right. <laughs> but so, if there's time, we'll take questions. <laughs> that's right. So good morning, Claudio, and, and good welcome. Morning. So start from the top. Talk to us about about uh, uh, malevolent software and malevolent people. Uh, malevolent people. Um, I don't know that much about malevolent people, but I did write a book on, on cyber fraud recently, and, and I had an opportunity to review hundreds of cyber criminal cases, uh, and I'll try to limit the number of times I say cyber. Um, so just uh, right off the bat, I wanted to say that um, uh, some of the slides that you've seen I s are simply screen grabs off of the interwebs. Mm -hmm. And if you need uh, references, simply email us and I'll be happy to provide because I, I haven't included all of them. So mm -hmm. we don't want to get into any any sort of uh, ownership issues here. Now the interwebs, that's, fa that's that fancy inter new that's technology that, that yeah. everybody's talking about? Well, we think it's going to catch on. Um, it's right. slowly being filled with traffic. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's full of traffic. It is. And some of what we're talking about today is legitimate versus illegitimate, um, evil versus good, um, um, commercial versus non-traffic. Yeah. And of course, uh, we need to figure out a way to define what we mean by, by, um, by malware and by malicious traffic. And, and of course, uh, there's the malfeasance, malfeasance, um, malfeasance? Malthusian? Yeah. Oh, wait. Yes, it's a going too far. model. Yes, indeed. <laughs> um, and, and what we mean by that. So, so really, we're, we're trying to take a big picture look at Internet traffic. What do we think is going on on the, on the interwebs? And as it turns out, a lot is going on on the interwebs every mm -hmm. day. Um, there's, and I say interwebs, by the way, half-jokingly, but really, web traffic is... Uh, is the bulk of the driver of this of this traffic. So, um, so whether or not it's pure HTTP or whether it's a web page that pulls a lot of this content, we're talking about file sharing now representing a significant portion of of, uh, of internet traffic. But mm -hmm. we're also talking about mobile, and the growth of mobile over the past few years has been staggering. No wonder. Uh, all the big guys have invested, and in fact, they've changed their business model. Microsoft, Facebook, and so on have changed their business model to adopt and to embrace mobile. Mobile is really where it's at, partly because it allows for very precise tracking of users and geolocating, and partly because you want to deliver content where people are. And it can make a significant difference to your monthly uh, bill. That's Absolutely. right, and your data caps, you know. But Claudio, I mean, has, so in your slide, I mean, you, you show how uh, mobile video has gone up, I guess, what, in that four or five year period, um, I take it. But has mobile web data VoIP traffic fallen? So the... Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's almost paradoxical. Yeah, so th everything's relative, right? And, right. And so, so years ago, we saw a tremendous amount of growth in VoIP. Uh, VoIP being both commercial and and personal uh, type of Skype, Skyping back and forth, and, mm -hmm. yes. uh, and of course the growth of all the, 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 the mom and pop telcos. Um, that hasn't continued to grow. What's continued to grow has been the traffic that's being pushed through the different 
connection. So all the companies that have been selling VoIP over the years have also been diversifying. And now they're providing data services. And through those data services, you've got uh, video content. And by far, I video see. content is the bulk of what you're going to see on the Internet today. Right. All right. That's it. And um, just a quick, a quick definitional. I mean, we, we bounce between malware and malicious content. But, I mean, uh, you know, um, all, all malware is malicious content, but there are other aspects of malicious content. Are there not? I mean, are we talking generally about ransomware, DDoS, um, adware? Or, or, are these terms interchangeable? Well, they're certainly interrelated. So, for example, when we talk about a denial of service attack, this is a commercial activity that typically goes on when someone wants uh, a website taken down or another party to be flooded with information or with junk data. And we can see a lot of this activity on uh, many of the threat maps uh, online. You literally type in threat map and, and you'll see a, a number of, of live attacks going on. All of that is, is malicious. Uh, yes. I mean, we don't we don't need to 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 overdefine it. Uh, but what else fits within the definition of malicious? Well, in some cases, people want to fit in criminal activity as as malicious. Not necessarily always. Uh, obviously, uh, whether you. I mean, I'm not a lawyer, but whether you want to bring in the definition of malice and intent and all of that stuff yes. into it, um, I call it literally illegitimate traffic. I mean, yeah. uh, that, mm -hmm. that traffic shouldn't be there. You, right. you should not be, uh, you know, child porn uh, might be traded back and forth between people. Uh, and I don't know about establishing, establishing malice, but it definitely is criminal, definitely criminal. and it should not That's exist. Right. Interesting. Yep. So, <clears throat> by the way, stop bragging about not being a lawyer, okay? <laughs> right, he tends to do that a lot. <laughs> yeah, I noticed that. <laughs> just, a just a step back from the... You know, mm -hmm. So, malicious traffic. Uh, malicious traffic, more and more we're seeing that it obviously cannot be inspected. There's a, an internet movement that says everything needs to be encrypted now right now, uh, HTTPS, browsers are starting to, to flag websites that are not HTTPS enabled. And so there's a movement towards increasing the opaque nature of the internet. And that's a problem from a filtering perspective. And that's a problem for ISPs mm -hmm. as, they're being, as they're being positioned as the front lines in the fight against at least copyright infringement. So as ISPs are feeling the pressure to stop illegal file, file sharing, uh, they're going back and saying, well, look, uh, our, our users are using VPNs, our users are accessing HTTPS websites. Uh, we can see the volume of stuff that goes through this, but really, it's, it's, we, we cannot identify it. We don't know what's it. there. But they can't open even, the curtain. We can't even see where it's going. Uh, right. They can't even see its destination. That's right. And yet, and yet who would say you know, don't encrypt your stuff so that the ISP can, can uh, more, more easily police it. And ultimately, it's more work for them. Right? Sure. So, so if they accept the job of policing the Internet, or at least the small portion of the Internet that they're responsible for, then they need to assign resources to that. Yes. And these are individuals who are not trained to police the Internet. You, what are you well, going to do? I mean, it, should, should they even? I mean, that's, that's mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, Stephen, you and I were talking about that very point. You know, should, should they? Should there be mm -hmm. a rule that says that the ISPs ought to do this or that in connection right. with the... It uh, begs that question, yeah. who is best positioned and who is highly yeah. motivated? Right. Um, you know, what are the upsides and, and are those benefits accrued to them or to others? It's mm -hmm. one of those externality questions, I think. Yeah. But... Uh, Sure. Highly motivated and incentivized. So on this slide, we see uh, that ads, so malicious web traffic, traffic can be simple stuff like literally ad traffic. So uh, ad servers that, that uh, serve up malicious content could be considered malicious traffic. How do, you, how do you differentiate? If it comes from a source that is considered to be legitimate, Mm -hmm. And if it comes from a source that is consistently serving up malicious ads, then, then do you look at it as a malicious 
server, or do you look at it as, uh, as, as malicious traffic in and of itself? And I say this because it matters from a filtering perspective. You're either looking at stuff that's being transferred, or you're looking at the provider itself. If, in fact, you're looking at the provider itself, Mm -hmm. Then you can block that provider and right. bam, you and the can say, hey, you know along its way. that's right. But and I've done my part for clearing 9.27% of the internet of malware. You've got to be careful with that stuff. Absolutely. Because, I mean, it's a very tricky Let's say you're thing. a good guy, Claudio. Well, hypothetically. Okay. Hypothetically, uh, hypothetically, you're a good guy. And then you sneeze at me. That, you, you know, I get a cold. You're a good guy. If, I, if, I, if, I, if I'm filtering out my aversion to disease, if I'm trying to avoid disease, do I avoid you or do I, do I avoid do everybody who has a cold? What do I do? Well, you and thank me, obviously. If it doesn't kill you, it'll make you stronger. <laughs> yeah, well, I my Or do you wear a mask? In my experience, whatever doesn't I kill you makes you really sick. <laughs> but uh, you, you, you can think what you like. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, when we talk about filtering and expecting different parties to do their job of filtering internet traffic. We need to understand that internet traffic exists, just like all traffic, exists at different layers. And those layers are meant for technology to speak to other technology. So when we're talking about um, all of these different levels of abstraction, there are seven uh, difference of, uh, different layers of abstraction in the OSI model, uh, the Open Systems Interconnect model. These different layers literally talk to other layers within other devices. So layer four devices talk to layer four devices elsewhere in the world. And that carries with it some traffic. Layer seven traffic is also carried along. And the reason we're making a distinction between these layers is simply to be able to have some expectation as to how we can anticipate the traffic that should be filtered. And here's, here's an example of the protocols that should be expected to exist at all these different uh, layers. So when we're talking about web traffic, this is layer seven traffic. We're talking about the top level um, website uh, serving, and and we're saying, look, these are the kinds of tools that humans use, and the kinds of tools that humans use are vulnerable to specific attacks, and we'll talk about that on the next slide. And that's at the top layer, the application mm -hmm. layer. That's right. Yeah, but if you, I, you know, you hear people talk about, well, we've got transport layer security. You know, we we have yes. right. That that's one layer only, mm -hmm. right? And uh, you. I don't know, should you brag about having transport layer security? Hell yeah. Oh, I, I, no. It's a great layer to have. Oh, But yeah. you've got to pad it. You have to pad it with other layers. Yeah, if, yeah. If, if you have uh, just bragged about having one layer, it means you might be myopic about some other, some other aspects mm -hmm. of your filtering. You might be giving people a false sense of security mm -hmm. insofar as your ability right. to filter other traffic. It might, it, it, it might just mean that you're advertising the fact that you, you don't have application layer or presentation layer yes. uh, traffic filtering, which makes it very easy so to attack. So each OSI layer, Claudio, is a potential access point for malicious content? That's right. I mean, and so you can see the different types of attacks that you can use at any yes. layer. And those are those are basically, a, they represent a catalog of options mm -hmm. to cyber attackers, to malicious parties that want to use one or two or three or ten in, uh, in tandem uh, so as to attack a, a target or series of targets. And in so doing, they're able to string along um, a scenario, a desired scenario that is very difficult to unravel because you have to figure out uh, you have to figure out where these things are coming from, yes. what devices they're attacking, and what devices they're using to hop over to other devices. So just by way of example, going to the very bottom at the uh, physical layer, the 802.11, Wi-Fi? Is that uh, a Wi-Fi? Yeah. So for example, that, would that be a breach of oh, yes, privacy? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is my neighbor eavesdropping or uh, using my uh, piggybacking sure. on my Wi-Fi. Yeah. That's yeah. A, Generally right. speaking, the physical layer and the data link layer are your physical cable or your physical connection. Right. So, so if I'm going to be there with my alligator clips and, and uh, looking all professional with the hat and... Mm -hmm. Clipboard. Uh, yeah. Uh, butt set. Um, yep. 
that's yeah. that's where you want your physical attacks to occur. Yes. Hmm. So the key layers are obviously the ones that have something to do with, with humans, but also that have to do with the higher level of abstraction. So when we talk abstraction, we understand the fact that all the lower levels, all the lower layers contribute to creating an experience, uh, a session, uh, um, a situation for the top layer. So really everything goes towards that that. Um, uh, layer seven, that application layer. Yes, and that's why it's been an opportunity for many organizations, like OWASP, for example, to create standards and to allow web developers and the industry as a whole to identify vulnerabilities that plague some of those higher layers. So I don't, I didn't want this to deteriorate into into a fear mongering episode, and I wanted to oh, say, why yeah, not? There that's, are, that's always that's right. How do you think lawyers make money? How, how do they make money? <laughs> We need fear. <laughs> That's right. Um, so, uh, so yes, there are solutions to it. There are standards in place. There are opportunities to apply best practices and, and guidelines to uh, detect these without overwhelming corporate budgets and without uh, necessarily having to spend all your money on, uh, on technology. Mm -hmm. um, so this is just another, another set of two slides. Um, microscopic writing uh, yes. that um, <laughs> yeah, magnify really, this on your uh, on your monitors <laughs> this is <laughs> for, here those, to, for those attending <laughs> to help motivated attackers uh, it's really only the very motivated individuals that will zoom into this slide uh, won't it uh, it's I, really a honeypot slide isn't it mm -hmm. yeah but Claudio uh, I do have a question on that I notice when you talk about the mitig mitigating options on the far right column for the attack type I think if I'm reading that correctly in the small font uh, mitigation options for the attack type. Correct me if I'm wrong, all of these at different layers seem to be all steps taken by ISPs with perhaps one exception and that is on the session uh, layer you've got uh, we've got on the far right column check with your hardware provider to determine if there's a session update or patch. Oh, a version update. Or a version update. But is that, sorry, is that a step taken by the end user or is, so, are all of these access provider steps. I'm just trying to get These are steps that yeah. are taken by uh, whoever has control of the technology. So if you've got gateway technology access, so if you're a, corp yes. a company that runs their own routers and their own modems mm -hmm. or, wow. or gramophones or whatever the latest technology is, um, you have the opportunity here to control what goes through those gateway devices. Yes. Uh, so you don't have to be an ISP. Right. Obviously, yes, they have, they have a lot of control, not just over the last mile, but over, mm -hmm. the, over core connectivity, depending yeah. on how large they are. Yes. But uh, corporations, uh, businesses, even individuals mm -hmm. sometimes uh, can act as their own mm -hmm. ISPs, essentially, for the last uh, meter, e effectively. So some of these mitig mitigative steps are taken by different actors along the chain. Of communication that's effectively. right that's right so so you take as much control as you can it yes. is really the answer here and and if you understand what you need to do to control network traffic then you can control the filtering within your own little environment indeed um, all right without going too too technical with this uh, so yeah, obviously we've seen um, IP traffic growth. I, I remember 15 years ago, or perhaps longer, 20, um, when there was a real fear that the internet would crumble under the volume of traffic. Yeah. Uh, it literally was was uh, was going to be full. In fact, I, I had a profile picture that says, "Go away, the internet is full." Um, just to try mm -hmm. to save the internet by, by shooing mm -hmm. people away. It was actually my fault. I kept looking for the very last page. <laughs> and you were was, pressing the any I was, key? I was pushing the any key. That's so right. you brought down the network. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, the buffer is just clearing now. Um, <laughs> so anyone can see uh, any attack map on the internet. And those attack maps, if you literally type into... Uh, a search engine, the words attack map, it'll come up with about six or seven um, that that are nicely animated, they're mm -hmm. great for screensavers, uh, but the interesting thing is that they tell you the kind of traffic that they're seeing, and the kind of traffic that they're typically seeing is large amounts of volume, and the one type of volume that 
um, that that we're seeing in every single instance is denial of service traffic. Yeah. I see. That's the most prevalent. Mm -hmm. That's right. So so really, if you're looking for for traffic. If you're looking for, for large amounts of traffic that's overwhelming the network, well, uh, DDoS tra traffic will do it. In fact, it'll do it to the extent that it'll desensitize, visually desensitize the viewer from, from paying attention to other types of traffic that is a lot more fine-tuned and more precise. And those are often the most damaging attacks, the right. ones that are very precise, not the elephant gun attacks. So, uh, for example, attacks by, by unfriendly uh, countries are less likely to be DDoS attacks and rather something else, I take it. Uh, that's right. They can be false flags as well. I mean, they, they could uh, create um, something like this, an outage in, in one place, and perform a very fine-tuned attack in another. Um, so finely crafted attacks are often obscured by larger, more visible ones. Hmm. Yes, here we are with human versus non-human sources. No ugly bots. Well, because it says good and bad, right? So you've got the oh, good, okay. the bad, and the ugly. So where are the ugly bots? There are no ugly bots. Anyway, this is too technical, obviously. Um, <laughs> I like the colors. I do, too. <laughs> the Christmas <laughs> colors? <laughs> All right. Yeah, I see what you're getting at here. Sure. It's, it's don't blame the gun. So <laughs> the point yes. here is, yeah. is simply that uh, in many cases, bots can serve a very practical purpose. Sure. Um, for example, when someone wants Google to take down a web page that's no longer relevant to them or it was posted uh, without consent yes. or, or whatnot, <laughs> and you're told, well, you know, eventually Google will update itself with the fact that you now no, ha no longer have a page, or the fact that they've erased the cached version of your page, or mm -hmm. the fact that you've updated your site, or, or whatever. Well, those are good bots that are respecting the, um, uh, respecting the rules of crawling, right? So if you tell them, if you put little scripts in there that, that say, do not you know, scan the entire network, don't just index yeah. everything willy-nilly, just yeah. index the stuff that we want you to index, and please do it as, as often as you can without overwhelming our network. Well, those are good bots. So in, in, in the new uh, uh, GDPR, uh, the, the European Privacy uh, Regulation uh, that, uh, that came into force May the 25th, the right to be forgotten is one of the one of the, the, the principles there. So presumably, a good bot or a bunch of good bots would help that happen. Yes, and those are the tools to, to yeah. achieve that outcome. And there are incentive to building good bots because if someone has the right to be forgotten, then they have the right to be forgotten promptly. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes, that's true. So, otherwise, there might be some penalties associated oh. with not removing information well, that I, is up there without consent. I can tell you with my memory, I'm 100% compliant. All right. Yeah, right, with yes. giving your yeah. memory, Don? Yeah. yeah. That's, that's it's good. important to live in the present. Who are you again? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, in other words, uh, Claudia, that's so some bots, not all bots are bad. Not all yeah. bots on, are bad, and certainly yeah. not all bots, uh, not, all, uh, not all traffic is bot traffic. So this... Mm. This slide illustrates the fact that there's a lot of people out there surfing. <laughs> there's no <laughs> other way to put it. There are humans uh, that are adding to the volume of Internet uh, traffic. Yes. Uh, naturally, many of those are using social media right now and harvesting things on uh, Farmville sure. and Fishville yeah. And, and, yeah. and so on. Important work. Um, but others are, um, are simply consuming video content and that's that's the DDoS of the human world right if you're consuming uh, right. video traffic as a human it's the same as, as systems overwhelming each other mm -hmm. with, with denial of service it's traffic. an unintentional it's, DDoS it's, that's yeah. right so it's the largest it's the most visible type of hmm. data traffic uh, out there notice the last column here uh, Alexa yes oh. yeah it's a bit a of a concern. lot of traffic mm -hmm. my goodness During uh, one of our previous webinars, somebody said something, and 
Yeah. Alexa and promptly bought something off uh, of Amazon? Uh, yeah, Alexa bought a bunch of get Bitcoin for, mm -hmm. for somebody. That's good. It was all Alexa, yeah. right? So she doesn't believe in diversifying across no. <clears throat> no. currencies. It's Bitcoin or nothing. <clears throat> That's right. Okay. Well, buy it on Korean uh, exchanges if possible. Here, Claudia, this slide with the infringement, again, define terms. You talk about estimate of infringing use of U.S. Internet bandwidth. Are we talking here now about copyright? Copyright, yeah, IP okay. copyright. This okay. is just yeah. specifically now. We're not talking necessarily malware, DDoS. We're so this about is malicious content. This is malicious. That's what content. we were talking about. That's before. what exactly that Don and I were <coughs> ruminating about. Here we're now talking um, about real live infringing content. Mm -hmm. and, and so this uh, this slide that I borrowed from somewhere, and I'm happy to to to, to uh, disclose the location if uh, if prompted, because I'd have to find it again, um, <laughs> was, was really as a result of my struggling to define what we mean by illegitimate or, or malicious or malware or whatnot. And, yes. and infringing is, is one of those one of those aspects, one of those lenses that we can look at or look through to determine whether uh, we're using the internet for good. Yeah. or just wasting the, the capacity of these, right. uh, of these pipes. Look at the size of the bit torrent piece of the pie. Mm -hmm. that's, that's significant. It really is. Yeah. Although, Almost 10%. But presumably, so uh, is that static or could that be falling? I know on the audio, on the music side, it's apparently that might be falling, but perhaps not on the video, mm -hmm. uh, not on the, on the audio visual side. Yeah. Yeah. And don't forget the pie is getting bigger, so we don't yes. actually know whether, whether it's With falling in an absolute sense. Indeed. Yeah, yeah there's yeah. a number of systems that are still using BitTorrent. I don't see BitTorrent as being as rich and, um, and active as it used to be. Mm -hmm. um, I see a lot of content disappearing. And so uh, that's not to say that it's, it's becoming obsolete. The, the fundamental technologies behind BitTorrent are still fueling a lot of this, this on-demand. Oh, there's all video. kinds of peer-to-peer. -peer. That's right. So, P2P is, so. is alive and kicking. Mm -hmm. yep. And and uh, very interested in that slide, just because when Don and I were ru ruminating about this, I mean, it's almost like there's two types. There's this infringing content that might argue argue a role for an ISP with everything from notice of notice to mm -hmm. current takedown regimes, but then there's the other types of malware malicious content that is either bot driven or that how can I mean we'll get into this but how can an ISP or are there you know measures that an ISP can take or so should take or, or should, should take, take. Yeah. yes not uh, absolutely yeah um, so in our little oligopoly of a, of a telco system here in Canada our uh, service our internet service providers have long implemented P2P filters. Mm -hmm. So P2P throttling, at the very least, has been active, sometimes between certain hours of day, sometimes uh, depending on the type of, of, uh, of actual data traffic. Um, and of course, people have fought back and gotten themselves VPNs and have gone um, Yes. and have gone and, uh, and continued their activities, uh, bypassing these various filters, because they're saying, look, if you're saying that you're selling me unlimited traffic, and then you're saying, well, I can't download from peer-to-peer -peer networks um, right. at a certain speed or at a certain volume or under specific conditions, then are you really s selling me unlimited data traffic? Indeed. Well, of, cor of course. And that of goes course with your you should are. comment. Yeah, well, that, that I, 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 you can... You can Drink the entire ocean if you like. Mm -hmm. How fast would you like to do it? <laughs> and that—that's re—that's really it. I—I'm still offering you the entire ocean. Have a nice time. Right. Huh? So there's, of course, lots of offshoot discussions to have here about the speed of Canada's or Canadian internet access mm -hmm. uh, at the home compared to other countries yes. in the world. And we know that it's some of the slowest in the world. Yes. Uh, but that's a topic for another it webinar. Is. So we're seeing that global web uh, application attack traffic <coughs> uh, is specific to, uh, it can be narrowed down to specific uh, countries. That doesn't mean that much. Uh, it can mean that proxies exist in the United States and, and you can bounce through them and emerge in the United States and that counts as U.S. traffic. Yes. 
um, but certainly it gives us some perspective on the relative amounts of uh, application attacks. Uh, it might simply mean, at least from my perspective, that what we're looking at here is uh, malicious traffic emerging in the U.S. and targeting U.S. organizations. Right? It could just mean that. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's it's uh, originating in the U.S. It is it transiting through the U.S. Perhaps? It, well, or? see, that's the thing. Yeah. Uh, we're not really sure what originating means. Mm -hmm. and you can place proxy servers anywhere, uh, but if it looks like it's originating, it goes into this slide. Yeah, it's interesting because that are, might be counter to the kind of layperson. If you read the media about um, web application attacks, mm -hmm. you, one doesn't necessarily view it as much as North American originated. That's right. We yeah. think of it, you know, from from uh, nefarious regimes, whether it's Eastern Europe or it has like, yeah. it, it, the connotation is always that it's originating. That's right. You know, in someone's basement in uh, East uh, Estonia or something. And Turns out to be Peoria, <laughs> Illinois. Yeah. Well, I mean, people talk about Russia and Ukraine at 4.6 uh, and 4.3%, yes. but you see yeah. Canada's at 32 It's not that far behind. No. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. Well, so Canada does play a, a significant role. Yeah. We've got to work harder to beat the Netherlands. Though, we do, in, uh, right. In, in malicious traffic. It's, it's all about the chase. Yes. <laughs> yes. So, uh, so humans um, are obviously, the, the impact of humans on the Internet is, is being um, uh, overshadowed by, by that of automated systems, bots, mm -hmm. uh, crawlers, spiders, etc., but also hacking tools. And I think there's a, um, there, the threat feed map actually shows some of those tools that are in use. In this particular case, these are command and control servers for botnets or armies of hijacked computers that have been commandeered to do something, usually to, to uh, relay spam or to overwhelm some system using a, a denial of service mm -hmm. attack. And these are, are, are visible this way. Sometimes they lay in wait for a long time before they're activated. Almost Sleeper always. cells. Yeah. Almost always. Yeah. Um, they don't do things just for the heck of it. They do well, it the because purpose, there's yeah. a financial motive yeah. or a malicious motive or a political motive. Um, so just out of uh, curiosity here, um, I found this slide that was interesting. And, and it shows that uh, some, of, some of the... Uh, some of the world's countries that have the highest number of malware-infected computers are actually pretty high up there on the on the threat attack map. So if you it, it yeah, correlates on some yeah. level, yeah. right? Huh. And and Claudio, we're talking about malware-infected computers. So are we talking also about devices like a mobile? We're device? talking about sure. endpoints. Any any and and, and, and I consider. Uh, malware-infected computers to also be sure. uh, mobile. And of course, hence well. the exponential yeah, that, that's <laughs> aspect right. of it. Yeah. Yeah. So I still think I'm holding a computer when I'm holding my mm -hmm. Blackberry. Yeah. Well, that's right. It's not, mm -hmm. ju not just a camera that makes phone calls. No. No. Phone is the biggest misnomer mm -hmm. of all time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is going to be about Trojans, I can tell. Right. Yeah, it might what be. makes you say that? I just get it a could feeling. just be a large horse. Well, be, beware of it's a gift gifts horse. bearing Greeks. <laughs> yes. you got it. Um, so anyway, uh, uh, we can power through a lot of these slides more readily now that we've we've set the discussion um, at a particularly high level, at least. And I'm not sure how much time we have left, but uh, what, a, what a half an hour. It'll seem like a lot more. It'll to, seem like to a those blur. who are listening. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be like a blur to us, but the folks listening will oh, yeah, feel like they're aging much faster. Than oh, yes. I think <laughs> Einstein wrote about that. Mm -hmm. yeah, the, uh, That's right. Yeah. So uh, ransomware as a service has contributed, within the realm of malware, has contributed the most recently to the volume of traffic going on, uh, of malicious traffic on the Internet. And on a large scale, on a... On a uh, you know, through the ransomware lens, we can see that there are different families of, of ransomware that many times are purpose-driven. Yeah. And in fact, uh, can you tell us anything more about the Trump locker? 
<laughs> the Trump locker. Uh, I, Who's in there, Justin? <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> We don't know what the motivations and okay. the incentives are behind that. Right. Um, so, and again, some some data that's uh, that's available uh, shows that that many organizations have a particular view of how many times a cyber breach has occurred within their organization. Now, keep in mind, this has nothing to do with reality, or oftentimes it has little to do with it's just what reality. they think. It's a perception. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and uh, it might also depend on how people define what a cyber breach is. That's right. Yeah. That's right. In some cases, those are accidental yeah. mistakes yeah. Uh, by by their staff or management. Yeah, some kind of phishing, social. Yeah. Uh, really, what strikes me about this slide is that only 28 uh, are actually saying they don't know. Right. When in fact, literally, it's a hundred percent of organizations don't do not know, know yes. if a breach uh, has occurred or is occurring. There's right a bit now. of the mm -hmm. known unknowns, yeah. the unknown, yeah. Un right? Yeah. Yes. Well, yeah, we've talked before in a webinar with uh, Paige Backman about about how long uh, the average breach occurs before it's discovered, and I, uh, I I've seen all kinds of numbers, but. Something between six and nine months mm -hmm. of That's of right. just extracting data from from your system before it's eventually caught. You can have a coffee, go for donuts, relax, come back, extract more data, and you're not interrupted. That's Amazing. right. It's it's uh, around 250 days, uh, and then on it, average, and then it takes another 60 days to clear it out. Yeah. Um, and really, in the in the security business, we always say, well, if you've had a malware infection on a particular system, it doesn't matter how much purging you're doing of that system, you can no longer trust that that system. So uh, I am also surprised by the fact that 20% uh, have said never. Uh, we know for sure that uh, we've never had a cyber breach. Now, I'll agree if you're selling hot dogs um, and you're using zero. Mm -hmm. Zero cyber. If you're, you're using none economy. of the cyber, yes. <laughs> we use no cyber at all, so we can't have a cyber breach. Okay. Um, do you care? Yeah. So, you know, this is really an interesting question because you could pose that do you care question to an ISP, a, a, a corporation, an end user, a, a right? And you, you might get a different answer from everybody. Right. That's right. Right, and that's where um, differing incentives to mitigate come in, mm -hmm. I would take it, because some people are more indifferent, or some actors are more indifferent sure. than others. I mean, we, everybody at this table <clears throat> cares. Yes. Well, maybe not cloud you. I'm, I'm not saying anything. <clears throat> no comment. <laughs> Apathy. It's the number one problem in this country, but who cares? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well said. So the different types of information exposed in deliberate breaches will likely always remain the same. They're aspects of identities. So the more, um, obviously, names, addresses, and credit card numbers you get, the more financial crimes, the, the, the quicker your time to value uh, will be if you're a cyber criminal. So really, you'll be looking for something that you can turn around quickly and get the money out. You'll be looking yes. to break into BMO and CIBC, and, and hopefully they'll pay that million dollars, uh, because if they don't, you're looking at doing some work. And really, it's not that much fun if you're a cyber criminal. Well, apparently, apparently, they may not pay the ransom. They may prefer to pay millions of dollars to, to uh, fix their system than to pay uh, a, a ransomware. Uh, demand of a million, and I think you know BMO lately went on record as saying we don't negotiate with terrorists, and uh, that you know there that's you the way it is, or with extortionists, or with extortionists, uh, yeah. 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 in effect, yeah. Well, they're the same. Not that they were looking to negotiate. No, uh, these guys were not actually saying we're looking to get a million dollars or anything you can spare. They literally yeah. said, it's a million, a million yeah. dollars. Right. So there was no negotiation. No, it was, uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but it was interesting to see that the wallet that they pointed them to already had $5 million in it yeah. when oh. they asked for that million. So someone somewhere negotiates. Yeah. Or they want us to believe that. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, what's the purpose of a lot of this data? Well, uh, and, and the reason we're including the slide is simply because ISPs, if they wanted to do something about the malicious traffic, they'd have to build a case. You said should earlier. Mm -hmm. Should they? Should they yeah. be filtering? Well, they would have to have a reason, and that reason should be, well, we're trying to reduce the amount of fraud on the Internet. And we can see that there's a, uh, a certain a significant percentage of malicious traffic that can be said is abusive and some of that abuse goes towards fraud and, and as an ISP we want to filter this and, and so on. So there, there can be cases mm -hmm. made for filtering, but it's a slippery slope. But, it, but in your example of bank fraud or credit card fraud, is, is not the bank the more motivated actor to, to want strictures imposed on the ISP? Is the ISP less concerned? about fraud, or is it more because it's their downstream customer um, pushback? Is that oh, the issue right. that would govern? Right? Mm -hmm. I, I think there's a brand issue. It's there's a, a branding credibility issue. issue. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, there's an embarrassment situation, um, and, and you can apply pressure on practically anyone. So if you're the service provider and you're being told that you're facilitating malicious traffic, and the media picks up on the story and it says, wow, this ISB is facilitating yeah. uh, hmm. malicious activity on the internet. Well, then you'll probably yeah. feel motivated to do something about it. Indeed. Uh, so the least you can do is use some real data. Well, this is interesting. 81% hacking, 5% from sort of insiders, I guess, right? A privilege misuse. That's right. So uh, it's interesting that it's <laughs> that it's uh, only uh, five percent. I think these are 2017 numbers. Um, how do those breaches occur? Well, this has more of a, a more of a, an impact on organizations that are looking to stem the losses as a result of those breaches or anticipate uh, legislative. Yeah, and again, you come back to you know what what do you know? Yes, because uh, there may be a lot more privilege misuse than one thinks. You know, if you go back to to uh, a, a hospital that you know we won't name here in Toronto, uh, uh, the the that particular hospital had uh, for for uh, I think two years and a bit uh, a bunch of employees who were removing personal health information and selling it. Uh, this had to do with with women who were uh, uh, sort of post uh, natal and and they were selling the information to those who sell uh, goods and services to to new moms that 's right they so, were accessing it and yeah, they weren 't so much it. removing it but yes that 's true yeah. sorry they were they were accessing it and selling it that 's the good thing about information is that you can steal it and it 's still there still there yes. and it looks like there's extra it copies <laughs> that's right yeah it doesn't deteriorate as a result it's not like audio tapes where you we would right. we used to make so many copies of These audio tapes until they sounded really Indeed. really bad uh, but the so on that last point the 5% from privilege misuse we call those ATOs we call those account takeovers and account takeovers especially in banking are particularly important because when you're taking over an account with certain administrative privileges you can do something and make yes. many cases you can use some of those computers to pull um, a copyrighted traffic you right. can you can serve up video from computers that you've taken over and of course you can take advantage of the higher bandwidth of corporations that you've just compromised to transfer a lot more of that traffic and a lot of that traffic is p2p traffic just to just to circle back to those uh, yes. to those points. Now, uh, there's a number of uh, slides here that talk about uh, how malware gets to the marketplace and we don't need to go into mm -hmm. too much depth, depth here, but suffice it to say that um, I think there's a, there's a slide coming up uh, later on that shows that there's less malware being introduced online than there has been over the past few years and that's because organized crime is spending more money on a per attack basis 
uh, to create much more efficient attacks. Oh. They really don't want to be, it's always a risk. So they're picking their spots. They certainly are, and they're picking their investments, they're picking their horses, uh, and they're going to market with, uh, with their best chance of succeeding, and succeeding in a way that allows them to continue operating without detection. That's what success is in the, mm -hmm. in the malware world. So you're mm -hmm. seeing all this exfiltration going on, like Sony, for example, where yeah. they exfiltrated, what, 10 terabytes, 100 terabytes? 100 terabytes, that's what it was, over a period of months uh, that was being exfiltrated, and no one noticed. So this is the point at which they should have acted as their own ISP and yes. said, hey, you know what? I mean, we're literally watching terabytes just flying out of here. Um, yeah, what's going on? Where is it going? <laughs> right. Is this legitimate traffic? So that's the kind of filtering that many organizations should have, it's that yes. kind of um, content filtering. Mm -hmm. um, sorry to, 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 uh, to power through this, but, but the, the issues, whenever you talk about malware, for example, you're talking about different types of exposures, and a way to simplify it is the CIA triad, which deals with confidentiality, integrity, and availability. I think a lot of people know about these three terms, but it goes back to the argument that you're making as an ISP to say, uh, you know, do we, yes. do we care about people just inspecting data, or do we care about people modifying it, taking it away, damaging mm -hmm. it, or corrupting it in some other way, or do we care about people leaving it alone but blocking access to it, which is an availability breach That's an and a denial of service uh, yeah. attack. Right. Huh. Now, I'm not sure how many slides we have left, but uh, maybe we should give people a, a chance to yes, ask well, some just, questions. Yes, well, I, I just want to, how do we overlay then, I mean, uh, keeping in mind the legal and regulatory regime for an ISP, on, you know, we look at the Telecommunications Act, we look at Canada's net neutrality um, constraints. Um, for many ISPs, they will be reluctant, uh, I think, to, or unmotivated to take ex ante steps if, mm. if, because they would anticipate perhaps they'd be breaching net neutrality um, constraints that are imposed on them under, under the could be Could be part of it. I mean, I guess there's also the aspect uh, of of how you spend your money, uh, it, you know, is it is it cheaper for whoever an ISP or anybody uh, to to deal with uh, the the security to improve it and to do whatever is necessary to protect data, or is it you know because of the uh, how it affects availability uh, for other people, is it just cheaper to build a more robust larger, yeah. faster network and say, okay, you know, 40% of that is junk. At least now we've got a bigger pipe and, and, and so our 60% is, is good and, and we've spent money on that. And we can brag about having spent a lot of money for having the biggest, the fastest, the whatever uh, network in, uh, in North America or as the case may be. I mean, that, that's a, that is a, bi a valid business decision for somebody to, to consider, right? Yes. So, in other words, don't put your resources into that, which helps your brand. Yeah. And so be it that there's some uh, malware along the way. Yeah. Is I mean, that uh, sure? I mean, yeah. you could you could even you could even uh, you could even brag. You know, our our network is capable of carrying more well more malware than than yours. Right. <laughs> Right. We don't see that ad no, usually. No, I haven't the, seen that one. No, no. But I hear you. It's, it's a, that's the uh, there's a real incentive <laughs> issue. Um, but I mean, I do know that my understanding from the CRTC's regulatory framework, um, what they call the Internet Traffic Management Practice Policy, is that there's kind of a um, an acknowledgement by the regulator that that um, managing the integrity of the network is outside of the of the net neutrality regime. Yeah. In other words, if you're just you know, if so, if if an ISP sees some malicious traffic and filters it. That's really not, that's not censorship, that's not taking steps to block content or affect content. It's rather just managing the integrity of their network. Um, so I think, I think there's some arguments for saying we don't need to even change the existing law to permit an ISP to actually take 
mitigating steps. Sure. I mean, what, how would you feel, Stephen, if, if uh, uh, or, and Claudia, you feel free to, to jump in even though you're bragging you're not a lawyer. Uh, the, the uh, uh, you know, uh, a lot of people have these old sofa boxes, old, old modems and, and you know, uh, 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 sitting in their, in their houses. Uh, I, I had one for the best part of 10 years. Uh, I, I, I guess maybe the, uh, the, the firmware was updated. I don't remember doing it, but, uh, you know, the, mm -hmm. there's all that stuff out there. How, how like, is, is that an area where uh, government should, should be saying to ISPs, you know, don't, don't have this old junk around. Replace it frequently, or uh, as the case may be. I don't know. What do you think? Mm -hmm. you? Well, it, it goes back to our discussion around what's an ISP. If you're going to be your own ISP, you're responsible for updating your own routers. Yeah. Even if you're That's borrowing true. a router from your favorite ISP, um, you need to keep track of the vulnerabilities of that router. Yeah, because yeah. we can see this in the news every day, the list of routers that are being targeted by this VPN filter, so everyone Google VPN filter, the list of routers that are being victimized by this malware is growing by the day. And that's an issue because in many cases you don't have access to the, uh, to the firmware update function of your ISP's router. So what do you do? Yeah, well, what, do you? what you do is you buy your own router and you run it internally. So instead of connecting your home devices <coughs> to the router that you've got from your ISP, you connect only one device to the router that you've got from your ISP. And that is your own router that you have full control over, that you buy from whatever store you want to buy and you run your own network inside there. That will reduce the visibility that your ISP will have inside your network, and it'll reduce your vulnerability to threats that, are, that, that you cannot control. Right. Um, right. And of course, you want to turn off the Wi-Fi on your ISP yeah. router because you don't want them to provide it. No. You want your own router to provide it. So, that's so your a, router is Wi-Fi enabled. That's right, enabled. exactly. And, and it, does, that, does your uh, router have all the necessary um, your router it, loves it when you do that. Yes. So when you buy a router, it loves it when it doesn't have to be exposed to the internet and all that, uh, all that traffic. Oh, we that want happy on. routers. It, you but, want to have a happy router, and yeah. that router, by the way, should update itself if possible. But you should make a point of revisiting yeah, that taking interface a look. Yeah. and mm -hmm. have a look and see if there's new firmware. If, if you want to look that up, it's called double natting. Double you, natting. You but double Claudio, nat that, that. that is a perfect example, though, of of a mitigative measure taken mm -hmm. at the edge of the network by the user, the end yeah. user, yeah. not by the centralized You are in full control ISP. of that, that's right. But so then, then in other words, there's no one magic bullet here. There's no one, um, it, it might be a combination of steps taken at the centralized network level, if you will, for at the ISP level. Uh, and yes. and at the end user level, because that's what you're describing. Well, so the ISP is responsible, I think, for protecting their customers from threats that are identifiable. So if they can see traffic that is clearly malicious, that is malware traffic, then they need to put a stop yeah. to that traffic. Yes. So I think Rogers, for example, is an, is an example where they, if they see traffic coming out of the computers of their customers, they actually block access, oh, yeah. block internet access to those Computers and you are responsible for calling Rogers. Rogers will say, "Well, we're seeing that there's malicious traffic coming out. We can't help you with the eradication of that traffic. We're fine to re-enable this now, but just know that if we see more of that traffic, you might lose your internet access." Right. Because that protects the integrity of the network. Uh -huh. yeah, that's right, and that should go both ways. So that that's kind of yeah, that's what you mean about be your own ISP in a sense. Right. You, you, it's a matter impressive. of responsibility. You know, we're in this country where we, we love being looked after yes. by other people. You know, we all we have all these entitlements, right? <laughs> but but in fact, you know, maybe we have to look after ourselves a little bit. And I'm self help. You know, self help in, including that that uh, the that person who was crossing at the at the corner of front and young this morning oh. against the light, uh, you know, I Lucky I'm I'm her mom, so right. I, I stop. But <laughs> but uh, uh, you know it's it's uh, we have to stop being so entitled. But that's a whole other webinar. Well, so on it that really point, is. by the way, 
when I was crossing the street at Front Street. It was you, wasn't it? Uh, no, it, it was not, <laughs> but there was a police officer uh -huh. policing the use of that intersection. Mm -hmm. So you're not just allowing people to, to, to say, well, the light is red. I can now decide whether to cross on a red light yeah. or not. But now there's a police officer that's, that's there to at least imply that the traffic is being controlled above and beyond just defining right. what's allowed and what is not yes. allowed. Right. So, so you can, good, you can uh, keep adding layers of, of prevention, mm -hmm. uh, but where do you stop? Mm -hmm. So look, we're, we're almost done. So mm -hmm. I, I thought maybe it would be a good idea for uh, us to kind of uh, sum up. And yes. maybe Stephen, do you, do you have a well, couple of things you want to say? Well, just to pick up on this discussion, I noticed one of the questions that had come in had asked, um, does Section 9 of Castle of the anti-spam legislation impose a positive duty on ISPs? to police, screen, filter networks to prevent distribution of malware. And again, yeah. that begs the question of if I'm the ISP, I don't want to make a type 2 error, like it over filtering something that is legitimate content. So yeah. I would say to, in response to that question, I don't know your thoughts, Don, that yes, it might be a violation. It, I don't know if it, it imposes a positive duty because uh -huh. they might make a wrong step of over filtering. So I would say Castle doesn't help you, doesn't get you there. No, I, I don't. I don't think it does. I mean, that that section has to do with with the uh, uh, the placement of of uh, uh, right the initial act. Yeah, the, <laughs> the initial act of placing uh, software on a computer, and and yeah. you know that requires consent and yeah. so on. And uh, so, uh, no, I, I don't see it. It's a little bit like the the questions of of, uh, of uh, sort of uh, contributing to infringement by providing a machine that will help you infringe. I, you, you know, the, the, the nice areas of right. law. Right. So, uh, but, but yeah. to sum up, though, no, I mean, what I see just from as a telecom lawyer, I mean, I see these kind of tensions out there for parties, whether it's banks, whether it's financial institutions, whether those who are affected by by malware. To, to ask for more positive action, you know, for, for more, you know, legal um, obligations imposed on ISPs, whereas ISPs, my senses are saying, no, the existing environment is fine, we need a combination of mitigated steps along the chain, as you've described, Claudio. Yeah. So I think that's yeah. where I see the tension. For example, you see it, maybe not so much on malware, but on malicious content. I mean, there's a, a move afoot now by... Um, uh, by a group of content owners to impose um, a filtering um, by at the ISP level for uh, pirate, pirated content. Oh, yeah. And that's before the CRTC right now. Now that works on that type of content, but uh, how do you transpose something like that to malware or bots or yeah. DDoS? That's, that, it seems to me that that's a more complicated question. I think it's important to recognize that some tr malicious traffic is already being filtered. Uh, yes. there's, there's no doubt that ISPs are protecting their networks and their infrastructure from malicious, from, from damaging traffic. Yes. They're not going to allow uh, DDoS traffic if they can observe it, if they can see it, mm -hmm. if, they can, uh, if they can put a stop to it. If they can't, then they can flag it, and that perhaps is an intermediate step that yes. we should talk about. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if it, it, there's one thing to have visibility into something and to decide to put a stop to it, it's quite another to say, hey, you know what, we're seeing that this is happening, you're paying for the service, so uh, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's not our problem, but we should probably tell you that you're using up a lot of bandwidth yes. as a result of yes. something that you're not doing. So just an alerting or notification service might be a good thing for, for ISPs to demonstrate stewardship mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. visibility and Indeed. control and to build that credibility into their mm -hmm. in their uh, target audience and it might not cost that much to, no. to implement right. that It'll that cost kind less of an order pretty and, pretty cheap and i assumed on the terms of service of ISPs must already contain that ability even well today. yeah I, I hope so <laughs> nobody ever reads them but yeah but, but, I, I, uh, I hope so yes. well look, we're we're out of time what a this was a great Great Fantastic. Uh, webinar. Thank you, Thank both you, of you. Your, Thank you, uh, Thank gentlemen. You. It was very, very interesting. Thanks very much for attending, everyone, and uh, we'll see you the next time. It's been a pleasure.